On today's American Football Stories episode, we'll recap this weekend's college football action. American Football Stories is brought to you by Coach Paint. Coach Paint offers the ability to clearly tell a straight video while increasing retention of information in a shorter amount of time. Up your game with Coach Paint today. What time is it? Game time! It's going to be special. They're going to talk about this forever. Welcome to American Football Stories. Puts his head down, crashes and spins and dives. Touchdown! Bringing together the many perspectives that make up college football in the NFL. Football is one of the greatest sports ever invented. From players and coaches. Believe, baby, believe, baby. Hey, we're playing to win right here, fellas. To the front office and scouts. And the public is finally beginning to catch up, but they don't even know half the truth. Let's get the world. Let's get it. Your hosts, Robert Parker and Nick Knudsen, bring you... American Football Stories. Welcome to the American Football Stories podcast brought to you by Coach Paint. Today is October 4th, 2020. I'm Nick Newton. I'm joined by my co-host, Robert Parker III. You ready to go, Rob? Ready to go, Nick. How about yourself? Pretty good. And Rob is calling in again today, so he doesn't have that beautiful mic that he usually works with. So just, just putting that out there for the folks. But we're going to jump in there to the college football schedule. Uh, we always acknowledge this week the cancellation, the cancel postponed games, but we only had two this week, Rice at Marshall and Troy at South Alabama. So light week on the COVID cancellations, even though it wreaked havoc on the NFL for the first time. We'll get to that on our NFL episode, though. On Friday, October 10th, we'll run through the college football schedule, and then uh, we'll do the rank by ranked teams but first we'll start on Friday Louisiana Tech at number 22 BYU BYU stomped the Bulldogs 45 to 14 looking pretty good out there in Provo this year Campbell at Wake Forest the Campbell Camels only managed to put up 14 Wake gets his first win 66 14 all right on Saturday Saturday night at Death Valley Clemson number one in the nation defeats uh, in the ACC rematch, defeats the Virginia Cavaliers 41-23. to Virginia was down 24-3 to in the first half. They scored before halftime to bring it to 24-10. to And then driving down two TDs, they, they were deep in Clemson territory when Clemson DB Andrew Booth did his best Odell Beckham Jr. impression and snagged an interception in the end zone with one hand. Did you happen to see that play, Robert? Yeah, that was an amazing play. Um, great catch. Yeah, really killed some momentum. Clemson gets the ball back. They end up uh, getting a field goal. It's just just a casual 329 yards for Trevor Lawrence. Nothing special, right? And then <laughs> Travis Etienne has a highlight run where he shrugs off a couple guys, spins, and waltzes in the end zone. Clemson was a four-touchdown favorite in this. Virginia ends up covering but this is solid Virginia program that made it to the ACC title game. The Tigers are just on cruise control. This was never really that interesting of a game at any point. So my question for you, Rob, is do you think the Miami Hurricanes rolling into Death Valley next week on the ABC primetime game, do you think they're any real threat next weekend, or are we just hyping ourselves up? I, I think they, they're, they're, they're definitely a threat, if you ask me. Um, I mean, if you, if you go back and you um, listen to the interview that Trevor Lawrence had after the game, he pretty much said that, you know, um, it was competitive. I, I mean, granted, it was a competitive game against Virginia. Um, and, you know, normally Dabo was taking the foot off the gas and Trevor Lawrence wasn't playing, you know, into the fourth quarter. Well, he, he kind of did against Virginia. So I, I think Miami is going to have a little bit more resistance than, than uh, Virginia. And Trevor Lawrence is definitely going to have to play all four quarters. I, I think Clemson will have to really show up and play well against the Miami offense that is going to score some points. But – I'm at a point where with Miami where we've done this hype train thing before with them. They do look better this year. I like the offense. I'm just not sure they have the depth that Clemson has. We'll get into that in our gambling episode uh, this week. But I, I just I think Clemson, it just feels like they're on cruise control in the ACC. So we'll see. We'll dig in a little more, do some research. But I'm not, I'm not super excited about Miami's prospects heading into Death Valley next week. All right. Actually, I'll actually compare it to the next game we're going to talk about. Number 13, Texas A&M goes into Tuscaloosa and just gets flattened 
by Alabama. Bama does Bama stuff. That's the easiest, most boring way I could talk about this boring game. Mac Jones, Jacksonville native from the Bulls school, goes for 405 yards, five touchdowns. John Mechie the third, he covers 181 yards uh, receiving on five receptions. Jalen Waddle, 142. Devontae Smith, Najee Harris, they find the end zone three times combined. Tide rolls. AM put a little run together, Rob, in the late first, early second. There was a TD drive plus a tied turnover that had the game tied at 14. And I thought, all right, all right, the Aggies, they're finally going to show up for a big game here. But, of course, Bama just drowns all of those hopes with the 21-point second quarter. It's just an onslaught. and It's the same old song and dance for Texas A&M here. Like, I'm not saying they're supposed to beat Alabama in year three at Jimbo. And, and really, Jimbo's $75 million contract, it's just going to be tough to ever live up to that fully. But they should do something, right? Like, what's Texas A&M's identity under Jimbo Fisher? Like, what are they known for? It's just, like, kind of like a whole bunch of nothingness to me. I, I don't know. Like, what? I'm frustrated with A&M right now, Rob. They're not even competitive. I, I should be able – I shouldn't have to change my channel at halftime of an A&M Bama game every time they play, right? You're 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 right on. I, I I'm I'm frustrated right along with you, Nick, in regards to you know Texas A and M. Um, you know they're they're one of the best recruiting fertile grounds in the state of Texas, and they're getting top talent recruits year in year out. So Jimbo Fisher has proved that he can win on the recruiting trail, but for some reason is 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 it's not translating to wins on the field for whatever reason. Uh, Kellen Mung, he he showed a little moxie earlier in the game. Um, but once again, Alabama just do what Alabama do. They, they steamroll Texas A&M. It, it just really seems like Jimbo Fisher is not going to live up to his healthy contract. And it, for some reason, it seems like A&M can't get it right with being in the SEC. Um, you know, uh, Kevin Sumlin, uh, he, the only season that Texas A&M really was prosperous was under Johnny Manziel in his Heisman campaign season. So other than that, uh, Texas A&M has really been kind of on the, you know, the lower tier in the uh, SEC, if you ask me, Nick. Rob, I'm going to present my anger. And by the way, this is from unmet expectations. I thought Texas A&M, LSU lost so many talent. They're the national champion in name only. Those guys wearing Tiger jerseys did not win the national title last year. The guys in Tiger jerseys are brand new, okay? Auburn. Auburn is Auburn. They're up and down. We don't exactly know where they're going to land. We saw where they landed Saturday night. Wasn't so good. This just felt like a year that Texas A&M could really step up and kind of be that top challenger to Alabama. And I was expecting a little more of a fight. Like, I I, I didn't think they were going to cover – I thought the 18-point spread uh, – 18 point spread uh, favoring Bama was totally ridiculous. I thought A&M would cover that piece of cake. And when they came out after falling down 14 nothing, they kind of competed, tied the game up after getting punched in the nose. I thought – all right, this is different. This team's different. Kellen Mond, senior year. But Kellen Mond, the more I watched the game, and you know, I went back and I watched that Vanderbilt game last week, not impressed. I'm not impressed with the guy. We saw him. He was a guy that played as a, as a young quarterback in the SEC, and everyone kind of just anointed him that he was going to grow and develop. I haven't seen a ton of development from the guy, Rob. Like, I'm at a point I texted you during the game the other night. Uh, the other day, I was just like, I, I'm not sure I would draft this guy at this point. Like, if you haven't sold your Kellen Mond stock right now, I, I would say now's the time to sell. Like, I don't see this guy as a real deal NFL prospect. Do you, Rob? Yeah, I, I, I was holding out high hopes for Kellen Mond this year. But, you know, especially with the game uh, week one against Vanderbilt and, and uh, this week against Alabama, just like you said, if, if, you, if, you're, if you have stock in Kellen Mond, I would definitely sell it. But I just want to go back on to Jimbo Fisher and Texas A&M. Since Texas A&M arrived in 2012, Nick, they haven't won a SEC championship, a conference championship. Alabama's won, Auburn's won, LSU's won, and all those those teams are the three top teams in the, in the SEC West. So if you want to win an SEC championship, you can't even get past the top three teams in your division. So I think Jimbo Fisher has a lot to, you know, to do moving forward. Um, he's doing it on the recruiting trail, but he's definitely have to do it on the field and produce on the field um but once again Alabama just routed Texas A&M and that seems like it's going to be the story um you know moving forward unless Jimbo Fisher can fix something 
Now, I know we're being tough on A&M because Alabama, LSU, Auburn, we're also talking about teams that compete for national titles on a regular basis. But A&M fan, that's where you should be. You're not there. Get there. That's what we're saying. We got hope that you can get there one day, and you're not there, and I'm tired of watching these crappy games in primetime spots. Get it together, Aggies. That's what we're saying. We're saying it. It's a good, it's a good get it together. It's not a, it's not a hopeless write-off. It's not a disrespectful get it together. It's a good get it together. We want to see better out of Texas A&M. They have a chance next week. The Florida Gators come to Kyle Field. But unfortunately for Texas A&M, the Florida, ha- Florida Gators have two Kyles on their team, Kyle Trask and Kyle Pitts, and they're playing some ball right now. Life in Gainesville is good. The number three Florida Gators, they steamroll the South Carolina Gamecocks, 38-24. to 24. Trask and Pitts make some big plays, but Muschamp kind of focuses defense on Pitts, takes him out of, of uh, the offense in the second half a little bit. But – I, I got to say, like, even when you take Pitts out, there's there's more playmakers there. And I think one guy we've really seen develop, and I'm going to give you a comparison, a pro comparison here. Am I, uh, am I, am I using a little too much home cooking uh, on this, Rob? But Kadarius Tony, the guy does not go down on the first hit. And, and the more I watch him, the more he reminds me of, of maybe not quite Tyreek Hill, but Tyreek Hill light. I think that's a fair comparison. It, it, I mean, ever since he stepped on campus as a true freshman, everyone knew, um, you know, around Gainesville, like, you know, Tony was lightning in the bottle. But it just seems like he's developed over the years, especially with his route running. Um, I don't know if you recall the play where, you know, he broke the five tackles, uh, but it was a perfect route, uh, yeah. you know. You know, it was a, he stemmed he stemmed on the outside and he came underneath and Cal Trash just put it on him like right on the numbers and he just kind of you know used everything that he has in the toolbox to to take it for six. So I think the the progression that we're seeing in Kadarius Tony from a route runner, I I think you know that is the payoff that you know Gator fans are seeing and Gator Nation is seeing and I think Dan Mullen has a lot to do with that. He's a guy who's had some injury history in the past. It's nice to see him actually stay healthy here through a couple of games and develop because even in the past, it was tough to see back-to-back good performances from him. I would like to see a couple more deep shots to him, maybe see him a little more downfield in the passing game to kind of expand his profile a little bit. But, man, the guy's a weapon in the open field if you give the ball in his hands. But, Rob, the offense isn't the problem for the Gators. The offense has been cooking. What are your thoughts about the defense early on? I'm going to put this out there. Ole Miss – has a great offense. I think they're going to score on everybody in the SEC. Love Lane Kiffin. I think that South Carolina came in with a good game plan. They did the exact same thing to Tennessee on their opening drive last week. They had a well-scripted first drive with an experienced quarterback, Colin Hill, Colorado State transfer, played for offensive coordinator Mike Bobo during his days out out in uh, Fort Collins. I I, I think South Carolina – came in with a good game plan, but then they kind of got shut down. The other two touchdown drives they had on the day were off of turnovers. So for fumble recovery on a short field, 48 and 39 yards, short field fumble recovery and interception. So I thought the defense, it, it, it's still making some mistakes there, but it definitely shored things up against a less explosive South Carolina team. But I, I worry a little bit uh, how they would look against a more elite offense. Yeah, you're right, Nick. Uh, definitely a better performance uh, from week one um, with Ole Miss. But just like you said, Ole Miss is going to put up points. Uh, Matt Corral at the quarterback position and Elijah Moore, we, we've seen what he did last week against the Gators. Um, it, it's kind of similar this week with South Carolina and Shai Smith. It, it just seems like Florida, that, that nickel, that nickel uh, corner that Florida normally has, it just seems like they don't have that this year and it seems like they kind of have to move uh, pieces around to kind of find that guy uh, but it just seems like every you know every explosive receiver is, is going to have a field day against Florida if, if they're playing in the slot I know Kyrie Elam had a, a bounce back game he had eight tackles uh, Zachary Carter also had a, a pretty decent game in the trenches and Sean Davis um, you know last week he was ejected earlier in the game um, for a targeting call um, in that old Miss game Nick uh, this week he, he came back and he bounced back. Uh, he he's he's one of the, the the big playmakers in the secondary in the back end. That's a very important piece. And if Ty Grantham can kind of get pressure from the front four, like 
the Gators normally do. He, he doesn't have to blitz as much, and I think they can play a little bit more coverage on the back end. But once again, those guys up front, they're a little they're, – they're, they're young. Uh, I mean, Jeremiah Moon, uh, Zachary Carter, they're probably the elder statesmen up there. But once again, it's a, it's a young front seven. Um, so I think Sean Davis is really going to have to play, you know, lights out moving forward on the back end for Florida defense to really be um, consistent uh, like, it, it's, like it's normal, uh, normal in any other uh, season, uh, if you ask me, Nick. It's not an issue of talent with this Gators defense. They're talented all over the place. They got, they got good corners. Their linebacker, Ventrell Miller might, might be one of their best defenders this year at the linebacker spot. I think Brenton Cox coming off the edge has played fantastic. All the guys you just named as well. It's an issue of, I feel like that when they haven't put together enough consistency on at at the same time. So it's like the linebackers and and the D line can have a good rep and the secondary blows the coverage or the secondary, the linebackers have a good rep and the defense doesn't get enough push. Uh, Defensive front doesn't get enough push. It's like, they just don't put it together all at once all the time. But at the same time, I thought it was an improvement from Old Miss and we're going to see them go to Texas A&M, and you and I aren't too high on Kellen Mond right now. So let's see how the Gators play in Kyle Field next week. That would be a, a good early season test for Florida. All right, Auburn, number seven in the country. Didn't look like it on Saturday night. Goes to number four, Georgia, loses 27-6. to six. Definition of laying an egg right here. Stetson Bennett started at quarterback despite JT Daniels being eligible, and Georgia rolled. Man, it it just wasn't remotely competitive here. The dogs relied on mistake-free football from Bennett and a really good running game. I I thought it was a very balanced attack. Uh, It just swamped the Tigers early, and Auburn played catch-up the rest of the night. They had to go away from their running game. Um, I like their running back, Bigsby, but he was really only used as a a weapon out of the backfield for receiving. If if Auburn's playing some more competitive football, that guy's going to get more carries. But Bo Nix... Again, another guy. Let's put him in the Kellen Mond category a little bit here. He just seemed ready to be anointed as the next great SEC quarterback last year. Everyone thought he played great as a freshman. Of course, his first game, he beats Oregon on that last drive, even though he didn't play that great most of the game. But, like, I'm starting to see shades of Kellen Mond where we expect the leap, but maybe the guy just is who he is. Like, I I, I might be a little harsh on Knicks because it's still early in his career, whereas Mond's a senior. We've seen this movie over and over again. But – I, I think if he was a top tier team, he has a little more of an impact Saturday. What do you what you think about Bo Nix's performance at Auburn or at Georgia? Yeah, this is this is two performances I've seen um, that Bo Nix didn't have a a, a good out and against a Georgia defense uh, last year and this year. Um, I know Chad Moore is coming over to be the um, OC to help out Gus Malzahn in the play call, and I, I think you know. Bo Nix will be able to spread it out a little bit more, but it just seems like, you know, when, when nothing's going right, it just seems like, you know, drop back and throw it up to Seth Williams to see if he can make a play. And, and, and for me, it just seems like they have too many, too many weapons on the offense side of all, and they're too talented of a team to kind of rely on, like, you know, let's just throw it up to our best receiver and give him a shot, 50-50 ball, to see if he can come down with it. And I, I know Seth Williams, he, uh, Bo Nix actually gave him a chance to come down with the 50-50 ball, and he didn't catch it. Uh, he, he caught it and, it, and at the end it kind of bounced out, so he, he dropped the touchdown. So I thought that was a, a big point in the game uh, that could have, you know, swung the momentum in Auburn's favor. But once again, Bo Nix, he just doesn't look, you know, the same as he did last year. I know Auburn lost a lot on the uh, offense, offensive line, but once again, it just seems like he's not comfortable within the offensive scheme. And it seems like he's not comfortable, um, you know, throwing, to, th- throwing his receivers open. It just seems like his receivers has to be open for him to make a, a good throw. So I, I would like to see Bo Nix, um, you know, read the read the defense a little bit better, go through his progressions, um, and, and not just, you know, eyeing down receivers or just taking off and running when everything fails. Um, it just seems like Bo Nix has regressed and regressed these these past two two weeks. Um, but hopefully he can turn it around and Gus Malzahn, I know he's gonna coach him up. Um so I, I we shall see uh moving forward if, if uh Bo Nix can kind of, you know, get back to the anointing that the pundits uh crowned him last year, Nick. <laughs> Let, let's move on to a quarterback that we're happier with. Uh, Stenson, Stenson Bennett, man. I mean, he was thrown in to the fire last week. He was the backup last year. Uh, we talked about him a little bit last week. He played well in that Arkansas game. 
brought Georgia back, kind of steadied them. I mean, he's not a guy that's going to wow you, but he's just going to make the plays that you need to make. He's going to follow the script. And I think with Georgia's running game, you don't need an A-plus quarterback. But do you think he keeps JT Daniels on the bench? No. I, I think in, in, in order for Georgia to kind of, you know, beat the Alabamas and the LSUs of the world, I think they're going to need someone in, in, in at the ham to kind of make plays and, and drive the ball downfield. And just like you said, I, I think Stetson Bennett is a great game manager. He's very experienced at the quarterback position. But once again, if Georgia, if it comes down to Georgia and Alabama in an SEC championship, I definitely feel more comfortable with JT Daniels, um, you know, at the helm than, than Stetson Bennett. Yeah, it'll be interesting. I, I, I thought it, we talked about this on the gambling pod, but Kirby Smart doesn't really uh, – unveiled many secrets so it was kind of weird that he was just out there saying yeah jt daniels might play that's not really kirby smart style so we had uh that guy from 24 uh, 7 sports he was all over that he said i don't expect to see him really but i thought that i didn't think georgia would look as good as they look so i, I was impressed with georgia i thought they got out to that lead they'll keep them the dogs are gonna host tennessee we'll get to tennessee shortly uh next week but uh I, I, I don't know, man. I think if they struggle, I think you'll definitely see JT Daniels. Bennett, I think it's Bennett's job until he really – it's it's his to lose at this point. That's kind of the way I feel about it. But he, I definitely think he's got a short leash. I think he's got a short leash. But if the dogs keep playing like this, they'll keep trotting him out there. All right, let's go out to the Big 12. Texas, another team from Texas I'm frustrated with, plays TCU and literally fumbles the ball on the one-yard line, Rob to go in to win the game. The Horn Frogs, they were 11 and a half point dogs when we talked last week. I think they moved up to about 10 by game time, but like man, this is a game if you're Texas and you win and you advance to 3 and 0 on the season. You are in total control of the Big 12 with Oklahoma falling for the second time on Saturday. This is it all – I mean, I, you got Oklahoma Saturday. You could make up for it by going to beat the Sooners, Tom Herman. It, it's not a devastating loss because they still control their destiny. But this is just – this is who they are. Like, I, like, I'm tired of waiting for them to take the step. I, I, this is who they are until they prove otherwise. They go up, they go down. They go up, they go down. You never know who it's going to be against. I thought TCU played pretty well from what I saw. Ellinger – tosses for four touchdowns, and granted, they were on the one-yard line about to punch it in to win the game, but, like, what, what do you, how did you feel about this Texas performance overall? Yeah, I know when we talk about Miami, Nick, we always talk about, is Miami back, is the U back? And that's pretty much the same narrative that, you know, surrounds Texas, is Texas back. Texas is not back, and – and, and, yeah, Texas is 2-1. and one. They lost to TCU, but they're fortunate. They could have lost to Texas Tech the week before. So um, I, I think Texas is not back. And to be one of the richest athletic departments in the nation and to be, you know, in the state of Texas where you can get any, any recruit and just tradition of Texas, it, it, it should seem like, you know, they should be competing for national championships year in and year out. And um, – I think the talk's going to start rising if, if Texas keeps putting out poor performances, if Tom Herman is seat is going to be on the hot seat. So I think that's one thing that we have to look moving forward. But once again, I wasn't impressed with Texas. Uh, it just seems like TCU and Gary Patterson, you know, ha- have Texas's number. And once again, just like you said, they were driving and they were about to punch it in to, you know, take the league and they fumble. Uh, but once again, it's, it's Texas. So you, you don't even think it should go down to the wire like that. You, you think they should just have the pedal in the metal, you know, from opening kickoff to the end of the game and, and, and Texas win by at least, you know, two to three touchdowns. Yeah, I, I think, too, you look at the Big 12 standings right now, Oklahoma State, Iowa State, Kansas State, all, all two and oh. I mean, when Oklahoma's buried with two losses – so if you're Texas, you could have gone into that Oklahoma game. Instead of it having to be a must win, like it is going to be on Saturday, you could have afforded a loss. You win this game against TCU, you could afford a loss against Oklahoma, still win the Big 12. I think it's all about winning the Big 12 with Tom Herman right now. I, I wouldn't worry about winning a national title. You're, you're still pretty far off of that. But, I mean, we saw this Texas team. They competed well against Joe Burrow and LSU. They gave them about as good a fight as anybody. 
I, I would argue that they played them better than – I mean, they definitely played them better than Oklahoma. And I would argue they might even play them better than Clemson. They played Tech, they played LSU down to the wire. Maybe Florida and Texas were the two toughest games the Tigers played last, last year. This Texas team has high-end talent, but they just don't have that week-to-week know-how to get it done right now. And I, it's, it's got to be extremely frustrating if you're a Longhorns fan. The Big 12 is wide open this year with Oklahoma bowing out with two losses. They're not going to win it with two losses. Texas, you better win the Red River shootout this, this week. You better do it. Because if Tom Herman doesn't come through on a Big 12 title this year, I think that Heat's really going to start to ratchet up down there in, in Austin. So let's jump over. And again, that's a, that's a, I think you should be better than you are, Texas. That's, a, that's a out of respect. You really, need to, you really need to do that. TCU's a good team. Nothing wrong with them. But that was a winnable game to take control of the Big 12 for the first time in years, and you blow it like that. That's tough. That's a tough, tough result. All right. Another tough result here for the, for the Knights of UCF. UCF, the best team in Florida, goes down to Tulsa. Not the best team in Oklahoma. 34 to 26, two safeties, 24 penalties, six turnovers combined. Ugly, ugly game in the rain. I, it seems like a shocking result, but Tulsa did beat UCF last year on a Friday night. UCF accounted for three of those turnovers, 18 penalties. And I, I think that holds a lot of teams back, Rob. Yeah, it definitely does. I, I mean, you can't turn the ball over. You can't have that many penalties and expect to win the game. Um, but once again, I, I know Oklahoma State was getting a lot of slack um, against, uh, you know, dropping an egg against Tulsa for the most part. But I think this Tulsa team is, is, is really good. As you can see, they, they knocked off UCF. So I, I think we, we have to give credit, more credit to Tulsa, um, especially in this win, if, if, if you ask me, Nick. Yeah, defense for Tulsa is pretty good. Uh, their offense played very well, too, last night. Well, not, not clean, but good enough. And UCF was still driving on the final drive of the game, but they committed about three penalties, and uh, they had they had a botched, uh, fumbled snap uh, that took them back to midfield that kind of blew any shot they had to score. And I think it was just kind of representative of the entire night, even though Dylan Gabriel goes over 300 yards once again. UCF, too many mistakes. Uh, they they fall they fall to two and one on the season, and. Uh, that, that hurts. That hurts pretty bad for the their race in the American Athletic Conference. But the Knights aren't totally out of it just yet. Uh, North Carolina goes to Boston College. They defeat the Eagles twenty six to twenty two. First game in quite some time for the Tar Heels. South Florida goes to Cincinnati twenty eight to seven. Uh, the Bearcats take care of business there. <laughs> One team that did not take care of business is number sixteen Mississippi State Bulldogs playing Felipe Franks. Sam Pittman, Arkansas Razorbacks. Arkansas pulls the upset 21 to 14. Franks only accounts for 212 yards through the air. But uh, Arkansas, I think they're, they're, it's really about the defense on this night here in Starkville. KJ Costello, he still goes for over 300 yards, but he threw three picks, including one pick six to start the game. What did you think about the Hogs' upset? First, first win in 20 games. They had a 20 game losing streak in the SEC, by the way. So Mike Leach goes from beating LSU, the national champs to uh, losing to a team with a 20-game losing streak. Yeah, yeah Nick, uh, excuse me. J- just to put this in context, uh, I'm going to read a tweet from Aaron Torres, right? Mm-hmm. So the last time Arkansas won an SEC football game, Tua mm-hmm. had never started a game at Bama. Wow. Patrick Mahomes had never started a game in the NFL. Joe Burrow was at Ohio State, coached <laughs> by Urban Meyer, and LeBron was on the Cavaliers, and Kawhi Leonard was a spur. It's been a while for Arkansas to win an SEC game. And once again, you tip your hats to that defense and Barry Odom. Uh, If you tell me Felipe Franks only accounts for 200 and, you know, 250-plus passing yards and your your star running back and Rakeem Boy is going to get injured, he's not going to play for the majority of the game, I would think Arkansas is going to lose. But once again, the defense kept them in it. Um, You know, pretty much they – they kept uh, KJ Costello in that air raid and Mike Leach offense under wraps uh, throughout the throughout the day. Uh, the corners were physical. Uh, they they knew where they wanted to be. They didn't let the receivers get behind them. I think it was a great defensive scheme and a great defensive game plan from uh, Arkansas. So go pick Suey. They get the they 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 break the streak, the losing streak, and they get their first win in SEC in a, in a long 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 time. 
Yes, sir, as Sam Pittman would say. I, I like the Sam Pittman hire at Arkansas. I, I think it could be I, – I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled at what they've been doing the first two weeks. They play Georgia very tough. They go in there. That's a, that's a great win at Mississippi State. Hey, the Hogs go to the Plains to face Bo Nix and the Tigers. Let's see if Auburn's pounding or let's see if Arkansas can catch another team off guard next week. I, I think this Arkansas team is all of a sudden kind of an interesting watch week in and week out in the SEC West. All right, you got Oklahoma State laying it to Kansas 47-7. to We talked about the Jayhawks last week in their progress right now. Not seeing a whole lot. But Okie State, hey, you talk about a team who really had the door open for them by this next loss. It was, it's Oklahoma State sitting there at 2-0 in the, in the Big 12. That's a team that really – they've been on the verge of breaking through for years and haven't quite done it. Maybe the Cowboys are your new favorite in the Big 12 because Oklahoma – went to Iowa State. They dropped 37-30 to 30, the Cyclones. It's the first time since 1960, apparently, that Iowa State's beaten Oklahoma at home. And I, I think everyone wants to talk about Spencer Rattler and everything, but, dude, you put up 30 points. Like, you, you, you put up 30 points a week after losing a game where you put up 35 points. Is that the offense's problem? Or the D, I mean, unlike last week, he threw one interception this week. It was at the very end. It was a critical pick on the last drive of the game where he just kind of lofted a pass and didn't really pay attention to, the, to where the safety was, it felt like. But he got he, – he had the Sooners moving the ball. I mean, it wasn't like Rattler is some kind of bust or something. Yeah, you're right, Nick. I, I think this loss is more indicative on, you know, the Oklahoma defense uh, side of the ball. And I, I, that's kind of been the, the narrative in the Big 12. It's just like, you know, the offense are very explosive, but in order to win the big one, you have to play defense. And it just seems like Texas, Oklahoma, and, and, the, and the big teams in the uh, Big 12 don't play defense. And the one team that do play defense is TCU and Gary Patterson. Um, so I, I, I love Spencer Rattler. I, I think he's going to be a stud. I don't think he's going to be the caliber of Baker Mayfield, Kyler Murray, and Jalen Hurts, especially from a Heisman, you know, contender standpoint. Um, but with Lincoln Riley, you know, calling the plays and everything, you know, he's definitely going to be in the conversation. Um, I, I just think this Oklahoma defense have to, you know, get better because if not, they're going to, you know, suffers a couple losses during the season if the defense don't shape up, Nick. The, and, and we've seen at least a couple. I mean, it, it ha, it's been a long time since we've even seen Oklahoma just be out of it this early in in the season. And I guess they're not totally out of it. it they could get some help in the Big 12 still. But it just feels like that I'm not I'm not seeing a – I mean, we're used to talking about Oklahoma for playoff spots. I'm, I'm not really even seeing a Big 12 title game right now in their future. So – Maybe this is a year just to regroup a little bit if you're Oklahoma. Got to play better on that defensive side of the ball for the Sooners. Big win for Iowa State. Iowa State continues to just be, like, I, like one of the most annoying teams to bet on. Like, you, you lose to Louisiana, and then you're beating Oklahoma a couple of weeks later. Like, I, I just – why why are the Cyclones like this for betting purposes, Rob? I, I have no clue, but just going back to Oklahoma, like, you know, you lose to Kansas State and you lose to Iowa, um, Iowa State, who who lost to two Sun Belt opponents. Uh, right. So it just it just seems like you know we 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 talked about this the Sun Belt moving to the Power Five. This could be it right here, Nick. <laughs> I mean, this should, yeah, so they should get it. <laughs> they should get that spot. Uh, Oklahoma plays Texas next week. We talked about that. They go at TCU at Texas Tech versus Kansas. And I, I think it's safe to say if they get by Texas, they're going to win those next three games. Maybe, maybe. TCU and Texas Tech, they, they could give them a little run for their money potentially. But I think it's – if you beat Texas, I'm going to give you those next three wins, at which point you finish with Oklahoma State, West Virginia, and Baylor. It just feels like there's another loss in this Oklahoma team. And I, I, I think I'm ready to write them off in the Big 12. How about you? I'm right there with you, Nick. Once again, if they can't get this defense shaped up, then I I don't only see maybe one loss, maybe two losses moving forward because, yeah. once again, it is a it is a Big 12 conference schedule. Um, and I, I feel like it's a lot of uh, good teams out there. And, and plus, with the COVID year, the I think the advantage is, is on the field more so than Oklahoma this year, if you ask me, Nick. Yeah. 
Yep. You got, okay, let's move on back to the SEC. Uh, LSU bounced back in a big way, just handled Vandy. No problem. That's what you're supposed to do to Vandy, Texas A&M, 41-7. to seven. Big plays all around for the Tigers. Derek Stingley being back, had a nice punt return. Defense cleaned itself up a little bit. LSU, I think they got Missouri next week before Florida. So they got a chance to bounce back. They're, they're not done just yet. Uh, Missouri went to Rocky Top. Tennessee just – they looked like the Tennessee of old on Saturday. I mean, I know this Mizzou team. I'm not very excited about them either this year. But 35-12, to 12, Tennessee just controlled this from start to finish. And when was the last time, similar to what we talked about with Texas, that Tennessee just did what they were kind of expected to do? 11-point favorite, 11.5-point favorite, I believe. I think it got down to 10.5 at one point. But I was all over the Missouri Tigers on this. I didn't trust Tennessee with that big of a number. If you look at it, Rod, they were up 21-6 to six at halftime. And, and really, like, I watched this game. Anytime Missouri remotely got something going, they would snuff it out. The Vols' defense would snuff it out. And the Vols' offense was just very steady on the day. They had they had a good running game going, I think, uh, one, one sec. They, they rushed for over 200 yards. I mean, it's just a great performance that I saw on, on Saturday from uh, Jeremy Pruitt's crew. Yeah, I, I don't want to crown Tennessee and say Tennessee is, is the Tennessee of old, but th- it seems like they're getting there. It seems like Jeremy Pruitt is finally settling in, um, being the head coach of Tennessee in the SEC. Um, they've had the talent over the course of the last couple of seasons, but it just seems like it was so hard to put together. But once again, uh, in the SEC, quarterback play is very critical, and it seems like this year, Guantanamo is just playing very, very well um, it seems like he has a grip of the offense, and that defense is looking really, really good. So Tennessee is probably going to be a tough out moving forward for a lot of the top-tier teams in the SEC. Yeah, and I think that next week we'll get to see that firsthand. They're going to Georgia. You, you feeling any type of real – I think Miami going to Clemson, Tennessee going to Georgia, good test for two programs that haven't been great the last two decades. Yeah, great test, and uh, I'm, I'm definitely going to be dialed in and tuned into those games to see if Tennessee and Miami can officially say they're back. And the only way is that they, they start winning these primetime matchups in these big-time games. So in order for them to be back, they have to win these games. They, they can't just beat on the teams that they're supposed to beat on. Um, so th- this is going to be the, the tell and tell moving forward, Nick. All right, let's move on. ACC, NC State pulls an upset over number 24 on beating Pittsburgh, 30-29. to 29. I wasn't a huge believer in the Pitt Panthers, uh, but I, I did expect them to win this one. A little disappointing out of Pat Narduzzi's bunch. Memphis, SMU, big-time battle in the American Athletic. Memphis comes back from two TDs and fumbles late. Uh, SMU goes down the field, kicks a game-winning field goal. This is an interesting example of a COVID year coming into play here. Two big observations from this one. One, this was only Memphis's second game. They played over Labor Day weekend a month ago. All right? They were the team that had the party bus incident and got players caught COVID. So kind of, kind of their own fault in a way. But, uh, you know, you haven't played for a month. You don't see that a lot in football. It's, that's very unusual. So the importance of these games are – extra heightened in the American too. I also want to point out, we saw UCF go down and now we're seeing Memphis lose two teams that have been duking it out for supremacy in the American athletic the last couple of years. But the reason why I'm pointing this out is because we saw cancellations this week from the Hawaii bulls and the Bahamas, the Hawaii and Bahamas bulls. Both of them were just flat out canceled. ESPN runs those games. They said, we're shutting them down for the year. I suspect more mid to low, lower tier bulls will follow suit. Uh, and, and really, obviously, both of those are off the mainland United States, which has extra complications. So I, I really understand those going first. But in, in my mind, it just doesn't make sense to hold lower tier bowl games. And this definitely hurts conferences like the American Athletic. So if you're not winning your conference, there's a good chance you're not going bowling in the American. So big loss here by Memphis. How did you feel about this game, Rob? Yeah, uh, back and forth game, one of the, you know, better games of the, uh, you know, college weekend. Um, but I, I just think, you know, just like you said, if you're if you're not winning your conference, then I, I think, you know, the cancellation of the lower tier bowl games is definitely going to affect the lower tier um, conferences. 
Uh, but but back to the game, I, I think this SMU and, and Memphis game was definitely one of the best back and forth games of, of, of the weekend. Um, you know, Shane Bouchelle, uh, SMU, uh, threw a heck of a touchdown pass. Um, I, if I can recall, it was in the first half. Um, but um, and, 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 and it just seems like SMU, they're, they're one of those teams that we always talk about, Nick, where, you know, they, they have a good performance one week and then the next week it just kind of seems like, you know, what, what happened. Um, but, but this week was, was one of the better performances from F- SMU. God, throw the Cowboys in that bunch. Maybe it's a Texas thing. What's in the, something's in the water in Texas this year. <laughs> it has not, to be. Not, it ha- not it going has so to be. great. Yeah. Texas football across the board. Tough year, man. Tough start. Uh, but good, good win for, da- good win for SMU. So I shouldn't, shouldn't say too tough because I, they'll, they'll probably be ranked next week. I expect them to jump up in the rankings. Our right, East Carolina, Georgia State. Georgia State comes through with a 49-29 win. Sun Belt. Coastal Carolina, some more Sun Belt dominance. Over fellow Sun Belt dominant team, Arkansas State, 52-23. to Pretty solid Twitter video uh, geared toward Pat McAfee by a couple of dudes and mullets uh, from Coastal Carolina uh, chewing out uh, McAfee for doubting the shots. Check that out if you get a chance. All right, Baylor at West Virginia. West Virginia pulls this one out, Rob. Uh, Baylor Baylor played tough. The, the offense wasn't very good. I, I thought the defense is what, what kept them in it. But West Virginia just found a way, and I want to say this was – yeah, it was double overtime. I caught the tail end of this game, went back and watched the highlights otherwise. But I think this West Virginia team, we said this last week when we picked them to cover against Oklahoma State, they didn't get it done, but they quietly improved last year. And you see them taking out a team that finished uh, in the conference championship game, playing Oklahoma or playing Oklahoma pretty tough last year. Really doing a good job on on the defensive side of the ball. I mean, we we were used to seeing West Virginia as a classic Big Twelve team, where they're going to go up and down the field with everyone else when Dana Holgerson was in Morgantown. But I think we're starting to see a little bit of a shift in the Mountaineers program. Yeah, I, I think we are. But once again, I, I think we're we're seeing the loss of Matt Rule and a lot of players that kind of went on to the NFL for Baylor. And don't get me wrong, Baylor gets pretty good recruits, but it's not the Oklahoma or the Texas or the Oklahoma States. They're they're kind of picking the, the leftover scraps. So once you if you're if you lose a couple of big time players that move on, it's kind of hard to replace those at a Baylor rather than if you're at an Alabama or Texas or you know, Florida, et cetera, et cetera. So I think Charlie Brewer, uh, the loss of Denzel Mims to the NFL is really affecting Charlie Brewer, who was one of his go-to receivers. Um, and, and you can kind of see the defense is kind of hold on um, the, the uh, Charlie Brewer a little bit more without that, that, that big time target on the outside. But you're right, Nick, West Virginia is definitely, you know, normally when we talk about West Virginia, we, we talk about them from a, on the offense offensive side of the ball, not so much on the defense side of the ball, but but this 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 season so far, it seems like West Virginia has definitely improved on the defense side of the ball, Nick, which is going to fare well for them moving forward in the Big Big Twelve Conference play. Yeah, good good win for Neil Brown in his second year, at West Virginia. I feel like they're starting to make a little bit of progress there. And West Virginia, great program. They expect to win. This isn't like a program that's shy about uh, their expectations. I. I really think this should be a program that should be more competitive in the for Big 12 titles than they've been so far. Uh, but they just have – they've lacked – talk about a program that's lacked consistency. They'll, they'll have a great win, and then they turn around and they lose a goofy game. So let's see what the Mountaineers can do to follow this one up. Uh, Texas San Antonio, UTSA, uh, they travel to UAB. They lose 21-13. to 13. I think I saw a stat where UAB has yet to lose a game in Birmingham since they've been back as a football program pretty impressive stat north alabama falls to liberty 28 to 7 abilene christian goes up to west point gets uh drilled 55 to 23 by army rob you're a jersey guy have you taken in a game at west point i haven't i i we definitely need to get out there um i think that's that's one one game in our catalog that we we need to uh head out there um so we in the near future we Definitely need to head out to West Point. Mate. I'll sign up for another one because I've been to a couple out there, and it's awesome. I love that campus. I it, it's I mean it's it's a majestic campus, man. It's like right on the the Hudson River. You wouldn't believe how close it is to New York City too, just because you feel like you're out in the countryside 
on that campus. Beautiful place. Love watching the game there. Uh, I would go back anytime to check that out. But, yeah, Army, if you've never been to West Point and you're a college football fan, put that on your bucket list. It's under the radar. You might not watch a top-tier Power 5 game, but I, it's well worth the trip, in my opinion. All right, Texas Tech, Kansas State. K-State comes out on top 31-21. This was a hard-fought game. Uh, like like uh, like what Kansas State's doing, this was two teams they played. You got an Oklahoma upset in Kansas State, and they took Texas down on the wire in Texas Tech. So people expect this one to be close. It was. K-State pulls away late to get the win. Charlotte, your alumni, uh, your, your school, Rob, they fall to Florida Atlantic. Willie Taggart and the Owls, 21-17. to Virginia Tech takes out Duke. 38 to 31. Thank you, Duke, for screwing that up late and not allowing Virginia Tech to cover. Lost a few bucks on that one. Big time points and a big time win for the lane train going up to Kentucky. Mississippi comes out on top, 42 41. Dude, Kentucky missed an extra point in OT. What a crushing way to lose for the Wildcats. This was a fun game. Terry Wilson was awesome. He, he, he was really spectacular at times. And to me, I said this earlier, it's clear that Lane Kiffin's offense just going to score on anyone they play. Rob, unfortunately, the highlight of the game, though, might have been outside of a missed extra point in overtime. It might have been when uh, Kentucky running back Amir Ru- uh, Rose broke free, and he thought he didn't see the guy coming up from behind his left. He saw the guy behind his right, and he starts throwing up the deuces like uh, Tyreek Hill and ends up getting caught. Did you see that highlight? I, I did see that highlight, uh, Nick. And I think Tyreek Hill tweeted out. He said, hey, everyone can't throw up the deuces and, and, and score like me. Uh, right. Something something along those lines. Yep. But once again, you, you, they as didn't a get player, in. They didn't get you, in. They end up not you, getting in. They end up fumbling, I believe. You As a player, Nick, like when, when you have those breakaway runs or those breakaway catches, you have to just run through the end zone. And if you want to celebrate, do it afterwards. But to do it prematurely before you get in the end zone, I, I think that's, a, you know, you're doing a disservice to not only yourself, but you're doing a disservice to your team as well. And pretty much it came back to bite Kentucky. Uh, I mean, granted, the, the extra point uh, kind of hurt them too, but that was one big play in the game that I'm pretty sure they wish they could have back. Yeah, technically Kentucky did hold uh, Ole Miss on a goal line stand later in the game, so I guess we could like – or it was like a fumble or something. They got they got one back deep in their own territory, so kind of evened out because after getting caught, Kentucky ends up getting stuffed on the goal line, fumbling the ball, Ole Miss recovers. So not, not, not your best moment if you're Kentucky. Really surprised about the score, though. I thought this was going to be under for sure. Kentucky's got a solid defense, and if Ole Miss is doing this at Kentucky, I, I, they're going to put up some points across the board I, I expect I expect them to uh, be a very fun watch week in and week out with Lane Kiffin's got some toys to play with on that offense all right Jacksonville State the Gamecocks another set of Gamecocks traveling to the state of Florida uh, I think they fared uh, just about as well as South Carolina did uh, uh, Jacksonville State going to Tallahassee playing Florida State man Jacksonville State was up 21-7 in this one before uh, Jordan Travis and the Knowles they end up kind of taking over in the second half and coming back, it's 41-24 to 24 is your final. A little bit of a quarterback situation in Tallahassee. It looks like Travis probably going to be the guy going forward. What do you, what do you think about this one for the Knowles, Rob? I, I think it's a great switch up for the Knowles. They, they kind of have to shake something up, um, you know, get a spark. And uh, Jordan Travis, uh, he's, he's a tough kid. Uh, when, he, when he comes in, you can kind of see the, the offense rally behind him a little bit. Um, but I, I think, you know, Florida State was definitely looking ahead to Notre Dame uh, in prime time um, this coming week. But once again, if oh, you're Florida sure. State, it, it, you, you can't. If you're Florida State, you can't. You have, <laughs> to take, you, you have to take one game at a time. You have to get better at each game. But it, it just seems like, you know, Florida State, you know, this program has a, a long way to go before it gets back to, you know, the glory days. Um, but don't get me wrong. I, I, it's Florida State. You're in the state of Florida. You, you, you can recruit, you know, the, just the state, and you can, you can you win a national championship. But it just seems like Florida State is so far away uh, from getting back to, you know, even the Jameis Winston days. So, um, once again, good, good win for Florida State. But uh, I, I just want to see them. How, how they fare this week, uh, this coming week against Notre Dame, Nick. Oh, that would have been a disaster if they lost that game. Uh, Tallahassee might have burned, but the Knowles salvage something. They they at least get on the W in the W column this season. So good for Florida State. All right, Western Kentucky, 
They defeat they defeat uh, Middle Tennessee State 2017. Navy gets stomped by Air Force 40 to seven. Didn't love those Air Force jerseys, gray with like a red helmet. I, Air Force already has great jerseys. Why are you messing with them? Don't get that at all. Georgia Southern beats Louisiana Monroe 35 to 30. Southern Miss. Uh, they take down uh, North Texas 41 31. Frank Gore Jr. scores his first touchdown as a college athlete. Did you see the tweet from Proud Papa? Um, it, it really seems like, uh, you know, Frank Gore Jr. and Frank Gore is going to be playing in the NFL uh, <laughs> one, one day together. Um, but yeah, definitely saw that tweet. Uh, that, that, that's amazing. Uh, you know, um, but once again, like, oh, man, I, we, we're going to talk about Frank Gore later, but. Uh, that that's that's just crazy how how you know indestructible this guy seems in the, in the NFL, Nick. Well, we took you through the nation, ladies and gentlemen, and that's all for the college football this past week. Um, let's recap. Recapping: uh, Alabama and Clemson are good, and uh, everyone else has got something to prove. That's pretty much what we learned this week. So we didn't really learn a whole lot, I guess. Uh, Auburn's not not going to be awesome this year. They'll be just okay. We got that too. Yeah, am I am I missing anything? No, I, I think we re- we recapped everything, Nick. Uh, once again, Alabama is Alabama. Um, you know, Auburn definitely didn't look really really good Run against bus. Georgia. Yeah, um, but once again, uh, I, I think we we definitely have to tip our hats off to Arkansas and and, and Barry Odom in that defense because we we week one we talked about Georgia not looking like you know the the Georgia Bulldogs that we, 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 we grown accustomed to, but maybe that was a, you know, maybe that was Arkansas uh, on the defense side of all that was making it tough for Georgia. So, um, and that's the way it kind of looked, especially with the big win uh, against Mississippi state this week, Nick. Woo! Pig suey. Yeah, we, we definitely got to get a pig suey in there. Um, you know, go Arkansas. Uh, they broke, they broke the, the losing streak um in the sec so i i thought that was awesome uh kurt hershkrieg even tweeted out um you know uh, he was like you know salute to barry odom especially you know on the defense side of the ball and i think you know arkansas they brought it and, and, and mississippi state probably was riding the high knocking off the tigers the week before and it came back to bite them but once again you tip your hats off to arkansas go pick suey all right rob if that's all we got uh for this episode you want to move on to the did you know yeah, um, I'm gonna throw you a little softball in the did you know? Uh, All right. This this this, this week, Nick. Um, well, it, fresh I'm, I'm month. In, fresh month I'm, too. We're starting over I'm, on the scoreboard. I'm I'm gonna stay in the Big Twelve with the did you know question for tonight. Um, so once again, uh, I'm gonna go with you know Oklahoma. So the the question is, when is the last time Oklahoma dropped consecutive Big Twelve league games? Big 12 league games or back-to-back games? Back, back-to-back back league games in the Big oh, 12. Oh, man. Okay. All right. Yeah, 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 American Football Stories is brought to you by Coach Paint. Coach Paint offers the ability to clearly telestrate video while increasing retention of information in a shorter amount of time. Up your game today with Coach Paint. Yeah, 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 so before our commercial break, uh, Nick, uh, we had the did you know question. Once again, I, I told you I'm going to throw you a little softball this week. Um, but the question was, and, and to the audience and yourself, Nick, when is the last time that Oklahoma dropped consecutive Big 12 league games? Okay, I want to make this very clear. I don't know this, but I happen to see this question floating around because I, I think they were saying it on game day yesterday too where – Oklahoma hasn't dropped back-to-back games since 1999, but you put the word league games in there, which makes me stop and question if you're going on a different tangent. But I don't know is my answer, except I happen to hear that 1999 stat like all day throughout the day yesterday. So I'm going to go with the 1999 answer and cross my fingers that those back-to-back games were league games. Well, I, I mean, you're you're warm, Nick. Uh, you you kind of had it right. So the last time that Oklahoma lost back-to-back regular season games was in Bob Stoops' first year in 1999. However, the last time they lost 
consecutive back-to-back Big 12 games was in 1998 in John Blake's final season. Oh, game. man. Uh, that would have been so, the next best guess, I suppose. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, I, knew, so I knew Stoop started in 99, but I thought I thought that was that league game. You got me. I told you. You got me on the league thing, didn't you? There you go. There you go. That's not so, softball. So close, close, but no cigar. Um, you being the historian on the pod, I, I thought you would definitely get that one. <sighs> Um, I'm o for yeah, October. You, you o for October. Painful, painful. All right, man. Good question. Uh, I'll try to get you back on the NFL episode coming up next. How uh, you want to read us out? We appreciate you listening to this episode of American Football Stories. Find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Please subscribe and rate us five stars. Follow us on Twitter at American FB Story and check out our website, AmericanFootballStories.com. Once again, my name is Robert Parker III, and my co-host is Nick Newson. And thank you, and we will see you on next episode. You play to win the game. Hello? You play to win the game. You don't play to just play it. That's the great thing about sports. You play to win. And I don't care if you don't have any wins. You go play to win. When you start telling me it doesn't matter, then retire. Get out. Because it matters. I hope there's Bigfoot. I don't think there is. The reason I don't think there is, because we found bones of dinosaurs and everything else, but we haven't found bones that I've heard of, of Bigfoot. I'm very upset. We should have been in a ball game with fast field goal. The coach had sent him in. We shouldn't have sent him in. That's a damn coaching mistake. That The kids are playing their tail off, and the coaches are screwing it up. He's got to stop that little inside trap. You know, the option didn't hurt as much. We played pretty hard. We just got to stop that inside thing. Offensively, we kind of sped it around, got the ball in the end zone. But, you know, defensively, we got to get out off the field on that two minute drive. Key injuries to your offensive line. What do you do in the second half? Oh, we're going to go play. We just got to keep playing. Thank you, coach. <laughs> he has a magnificent personality, I'll tell you. That. We receive a lot of mail during the course of the season, and uh, uh, a lot of it's good mail, a lot of it's bad. And one of the one of I the I would say <laughs> the most of it is good, though, isn't it, Bill? Yeah, I yeah. think I think so. I say 95 to 98 percent of the mail we get is always good. But the one question that keeps coming up, where Woody Hayes' name is involved, they say you're a man of no mercy, uh, and yet, <laughs> you know, frankly, I don't care much what they think. <laughs>